In the summer of 2000, five recorded murders were committed in the town of Ashtree, California. The first murder occurred on May 8th, and the last occurred on June 15th, coinciding with the arson of the abandoned Fretwell movie theater. Due to the unusual condition of the victim's bodies, the killer had been nicknamed the Ash Tree Butcher. Despite the shocking nature of the crimes, it received little national media coverage due to the ongoing election cycle. No arrests have ever been made relating to the murders, and the killer's identity has so far remained a mystery. The following documents have been compiled in an effort to shed some light on these crimes, and to determine the true nature of the killer. Newspaper clippings from the Ashtray Journal, May 9th, 2000. Local biologist murdered in home. Professor Gerald Jacobs, biologist and lecturer at the Ashtree Community College, was found dead in his home on May 8th. Witnesses claim that they heard screaming at around 1 a.m., which quickly ceased. However, it wasn't until the sound of glass breaking at 2.26 a.m. that the police were called. Jacobs was dead by the time officers arrived on scene. Professor Jacobs' neighbor, Nicole Min, said, I'd heard the scream first, but didn't really think anything of it. Once I heard the window smash, I went outside to take a look and see what was going on. I didn't get out in time to see much, but just a flash of movement headed down the road. I felt so guilty. I wish I'd called 911 sooner. I just assumed he had gotten angry or something. I had no idea he was in danger. According to police, Jacob's body had had most internal organs removed and all blood drained, evidently through a hole cut in the abdomen. No fingerprints had been found on the scene, and no signs of a break-in were found, though a window was broken by the murderer in order to escape. Detective Murray Brown of the Ashtree Police Department said, We think this murder may be a cult-motivated. The almost complete removal of bodily fluids and organs suggests this was done for ritualistic purposes. Unless new evidence is found to contradict this hypothesis, we'll continue to pursue this avenue of investigation. Transcript of a 911 call by Joshua Rodriguez, May 14th, 2000. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, uh, hi. Um, I think there's something trying to break into my house. I didn't get a close look, but I saw movement outside, and I heard some pounding at my door. All right, sir. Please remain calm. What's your address? I'm at 1645 Wells Court in Ashtree. Please, get here as soon as you can. An officer is on the way, sir. Please remain calm. Have you checked that all the doors and windows to your house are closed? Um, I think so. Give me a second. I'm going to double check. There's a few seconds of silence as Joshua moves through his house, checking doors and windows. Okay, I think every door and window is... Sir, are you okay? He's looking at me through the window. Can you describe the man you're seeing, sir? I can't tell. He's too far away to see clearly without my glasses. I just see his eyes. They're reflecting in the light. There's something wrong, though. Dare it, they're way too bright, like a deer's eyes or something. All right, sir. Can you back away slowly and get to a room without windows? He's staring right at me. I, I don't... Why the hell is he just staring at me? Oh, my God. Sir, sir, what's happening? He's gone. He's just gone. One second, I could see those eyes, and, and then they were gone. Okay, sir. I need you to get into a secure location somewhere without... Sir. Sir. After about 30 seconds without response, there is a dragging sound, and the line goes dead. Statement given to the police by Carol Winters, May 18th, 2000. I was walking home from work. That's only a couple blocks away from my apartment. I noticed a homeless man sitting in an alleyway on the other side of the street, holding up a cardboard sign. It was around 9 o'clock at this point, so I couldn't really make out what the sign had written on it. I received a fairly large tip that shift, so I was feeling generous. I started walking towards the man, reaching into my purse to get out a $20 bill. He stood up, smiling gratefully as I approached. 
I stopped once I saw the eyes behind him. They were reflecting brightly in the streetlight, kind of like a cat's or a deer's eyes. I didn't know people's eyes could look like that. They must have been glasses. I couldn't see any pupils or anything, just a silvery reflection of the streetlight. The eyes weren't very high off the ground, at maybe four feet or so at most, so he must have been crouching down. The homeless guy's smile fell away. I think he could see the fear on my face. He started to slowly turn around. The eyes didn't move, just kept staring blankly. Eventually, the man turned around entirely and was looking straight at the eyes. He started backing away slowly and pulled out a lighter, I guess to provide some light so he could get a better look at whoever was there. His body was blocking my view, so I didn't get a good look at the guy in the glasses. But the second that lighter flicked on, the homeless guy screamed louder than I've ever heard in my entire life. In a flash, the homeless guy was gone. The lighter clattered onto the concrete, and the sound of screaming faded into the distance before swiftly getting cut off. I ran home immediately and called 911. And here we are now. Notes from the Journal of Detective Murray Brown. May 23rd, 2000. There has been no pattern as far as I can tell between the killer's victims. So far he has killed a tenured professor, an electrician, and a homeless man, all in the space of under a month. It is possible that the killer may have had some form of prior interaction with each victim, eventually becoming obsessed and consumed with a macabre urge to kill to ritualistically remove the organs and blood of his victims. We cannot rule out that the killer may also be a cannibal. Something odd to me is that while the body of Professor Jacobs was found in his own home, both of the other victims' bodies were located much further away. Rodriguez's body was found in the backyard of a home nearly half a mile away, and the homeless man's body turned up in a sewer. Given the precision with which he removes the organs and blood, he may have prior experience working as a butcher. I cannot ignore the similarities between the killer's methods and the mummification techniques of the ancient Egyptians. Perhaps the killer has some sort of religious mania relating to ancient Egyptian religion. I'll have to consult the professor to be sure, but I'm not quite sure. There's no evidence of any embalming, and the brains haven't been removed. The holes cut in the torsos of the killer's victims do not seem to match any known tools or weapons, simultaneously too precise for a serrated blade, but too jagged for a scalpel or butcher's knife. It is possible that the killer has devised his own tool especially for this purpose. Statement given to the police by Caitlin Forrester, May 25th, 2000. My boyfriend and I were driving back home from camping down at the Owl Creek National Park. In order to get back home, we needed to pass through some woods. It was pretty late, about 12 a.m., when suddenly Elliot's car broke down. The headlights were still working, so it wasn't entirely dark, but outside of the range of the car's lights, it was pitch black. Elliot hopped out of the car and started working under the hood when I got this really uneasy feeling. All the animal sounds stopped at once, like a switch had been turned off. After a few minutes, I heard some rustling. Elliot finished tinkering with the engine and shut the hood. With my vision no longer obstructed, I saw the eyes reflecting in the headlights behind him. They didn't look like any animal eyes I'd ever seen. They were just silver dots of light without pupils or irises or anything. I couldn't help it. I screamed and closed my eyes. I heard this awful clicking noise and the sound of rapid thumping on the dirt road, followed by the sound of Elliot screaming. I heard the cries trail off into the distance before stopping abruptly. Once I was able to move again, I ran out of the car, going in the general direction that I thought I heard the screams go. I was calling out Elliot's name so loud my voice started to get hoarse. I got all sorts of scratches and cuts from tree branches and spiny bushes, and eventually I thought I had gone the wrong way. Then I saw those eyes again, reflecting in the flashlight. They were only about thirty feet away. I felt this almost instinctive fear wash over me, like I was seeing something that shouldn't exist. It felt primal, deep down in my gut. I couldn't move an inch. I knew that if I did, I'd be dead. Those eyes stared at me for what felt like hours. Then, just as suddenly, they were gone. 
and I could hear their owner running off into the distance. I kept standing still until daybreak. Then, I used my phone I'd left in the glove compartment to call the police. Newspaper clipping from the Ash Tree Journal, May 31st, 2000. Ash Tree Butcher Strikes Again. Teenager Elliot Hirsch, reported missing on May 25th, has been found dead in the woods on the outskirts of Ash Tree. Like the previous three victims, Hirsch's organs and blood were removed from his body through a hole in the abdomen. In addition to Hirsch, the corpses of four deer and a mountain lion were found within the area, all in similar condition. It's not uncommon for serial killers to start with animals, says Detective Murray Brown. But a mountain lion? That's new. I've never seen anything like this in two decades of policing. Notes from the Journal of Detective Murray Brown, June 2nd, 2000. I'll be honest, I don't know what to think anymore. The attacks seem so random. The only thing the victims have in common is that they have nothing in common. The animal killings bother me also. Sure, I told the press that he killed animals to start with, but the boys at the lab told me these killings must have occurred after the murder of Professor Jacobs. I have no idea how the bastard subdued a mountain lion, especially since there's no sign of a bullet wound or anything like that. Just that same damn hole and the same missing entrails and blood. Maybe he just killed him because he wasn't able to get to a human victim, but I don't buy that. There's just something off, something I'm missing. It also bothers me that we haven't found any of the missing organs or blood. And sure, maybe he's hiding the organs somewhere in some sort of lair, or maybe the sick freak is eating him, but it just doesn't seem to make sense. I'm going to look through some of the evidence from the Jacobs crime scene. I've got a feeling the answers are there. Excerpts from the Journal of Professor Gerald Jacobs Hypothesis our rabida specimens injected with a synthetic gene ARF23 will show improved respiratory ability, resulting in increased stamina and metabolism. Procedure. Three R. rabida specimens will be injected with ARF23, while another three R. rabida specimens will not receive any treatment. Subjects will be observed for any difference in behavior. Day 1. The test group has been indicated by ARF-23, while the control group has not. No immediate change in behavior noted after approximately two hours of observation. Day 5. The test group so far shows significantly more activity than the control group, including increased hunting behavior. Possible signs of increased metabolism due to hunger. Day 7. The test group has all undergone malts, while the control group has not. Possible coincidence, but unusual, as all R. Rapita specimens were thought to be fully grown. Day 12. Test group has molted again. Subjects are noticeably larger than is typical for R. Rapita. I decided to decrease the interval between feedings as their increased size and metabolism necessitates more frequent meals. Day 18. One member of the control group has died most likely due to old age, as it was male. Subjects in the test group have continued to grow with an increasing leg span of approximately four inches. Day 32. Members of the test group are now closer in size to members of the Theraphosidae family than Lycosidae. I believe that the increased respiratory efficiency is allowing the subjects to grow far beyond the normal bounds of their species. Estimated leg span is approximately nine inches. No change in control group. Day 39. Growth increase seems to be accelerating rapidly. Test group members now approximately 14 inches in leg span, surpassing the maximum recorded leg span of the species T. blondi. Day 42. Earthquake caused damage to the laboratory. One member of the test group was killed due to a falling object and the other two escaped elsewhere into the house. Day 43. Both remaining test subjects recovered, found in a cupboard. One is dead, and the state of the corpse suggests cannibalism. Deceased specimen is male. Surviving subject appears to be female, and has a leg span of approximately 16 inches. Day 78. All members of the control group died due to old age. 
sole surviving test subject is approximately 37 inches in leg span. Day 100. No longer able to accurately measure leg span of test subjects due to large size and aggression. Would estimate approximately 48 inches. Day 125. Subject shows no sign of slowing down growth and appears agitated due to insufficiently large enclosure. A dog kennel. Unable to move subjects to a new enclosure owing to extreme aggression and size. Unable to terminate the subject due to extreme aggression and size. May God forgive me. I think it's pregnant. Newspaper clipping from the Ash Tree Journal, June 4th, 2000. Detective quits over Ash Tree Butcher case. Detective Murray Brown has announced he is retiring effective immediately. Murray has worked for the Ash Tree Police Department for the past 23 years, but has recently faced mounting pressure from the public to catch the serial killer known as the Ash Tree Butcher. The Ashtree Police Department released a bulletin on June 3rd stating that the detective will be stepping down from the position due to personal reasons. Reports of Detective Murray's alleged mental breakdown and subsequent institutionalization remain unconfirmed. Diary Entry of Ashley Ellis, June 19th, 2010 It's the ten-year anniversary of the fire today. My therapist said I should write down what happened and try to process it. The night of the fire, the last time I saw George alive. I haven't told the shrink what actually happened, of course. I can't do that without getting myself institutionalized, but I can tell my diary. I'd lost my minimum wage job flipping burgers a couple months beforehand, and I wasn't really on good terms with my family back then. Couldn't afford the rent to my apartment, so... My boyfriend and I were forced out onto the street. We managed to scrounge up enough cash for food and supplies, doing odd jobs and panhandling, but it was barely enough. Of course, any extra money we grabbed didn't last long. Let's just say I didn't have the healthiest coping mechanisms for dealing with poverty. It took us a little while to notice the disappearances. But when you're homeless, you get used to your peers not sticking around and moving on to other places, but it was never this much. To tell you the truth, I don't think anyone else noticed, but much less cared if they did. Police put the official death toll of the so-called Ash Tree Butcher at five people. I know better than that. I bet the bodies were just somewhere the police didn't check, or they just didn't care enough about a couple dead bums to report it. I think they didn't want the public to panic. It was getting dark, and we needed a place to stay. With the killer around, cops had gotten a bit more intrusive in our usual haunts. We decided to hole up in the old Fretwell movie theater. I figured that place was so ancient nobody else would be there. It had been abandoned since the 50s, so most people viewed it as a death trap. George and I hauled ourselves over the fence surrounding the property, ignoring the faded no trespassing sign. Someone had already removed the boards from the door, and it was even slightly ajar. Right away, once we stepped inside, something felt different. I felt watched, almost hunted. I asked George if he felt anything, but he said no, confused as to why I was asking. We moved further into the old theater, and I tried to shake off the feeling, but the hairs on the back of my neck wouldn't go back down. Walking through an abandoned place can be a surreal experience, one that has been abandoned almost fifty years ago, doubly so. You feel like you're in another world, or in a dream. There's a tragic beauty to them, of places that once teemed with life reduced to a corpse-like shell. We meandered through the moldering lobby, using cheap flashlights to illuminate our surroundings. We reached the auditorium itself, marveling at the crumbling screen which dominated the room. We decided to rest there for the night, and got out our blankets, hoping for uninterrupted sleep. There was no such luck. I woke up late in the night, probably sometime around midnight if I had to guess. George was gone. I figured he'd most likely wandered off to answer the call of nature, but after about twenty minutes, I started to get worried. I started searching the building, 
periodically calling out for him, but to no avail. The stalls in both bathrooms were long vacant, and the manager's office was empty, and even the janitor's closets remained unoccupied. Eventually, after yelling my throat hoarse, I noticed the door to the projection room was wide open. I paused for a moment, staring at the yawning black abyss before me, the feeling of being watched multiplying a thousandfold. I mustered up all my courage and began my way up the staircase into the booth. As I made my way up the stairs, I could hear strange noises, like dry leaves blowing in the breeze. I shone my flashlights into the booth and saw a nightmare. The first thing I could see were the eyes. Huge, luminous orbs the size of baseballs boring into my very soul. They had no pupils, just silver circles devoid of soul or mercy. I felt hypnotized, paralyzed with fear. Then it moved, and my mind started to process the rest of it. Eight spindly, hairy legs, like bristly tree branches, rotated the bulbous body to face me. Its head was stained with blood and viscera, clattering chalicerae clicking together like a chef sharpening two knives on each other. I could see venom and ichor dripping from its fangs. Crawling all over its bulbous abdomen were dozens, if not hundreds, of rat-sized spiderlings, their eyes, too, reflecting the lights of my flashlight. It was all I could do to avoid fainting, to keep my mind from retreating into oblivion for my own sanity's sake. Its eight eyes stared hungrily, the two largest still reflecting like tiny moons in the dim light. My mind raced as I tried to think of what to do, how to survive. It was only then that I noticed George's body lying on the floor. Seeing him laying there snapped my mind into focus. It made me understand what I had to do. Neither George nor I could afford a gun or a taser or even pepper spray. But we found that potential muggers would back down fairly quickly if you sprayed ignited hairspray at them. This monster straight out of hell itself certainly wasn't any mugger, but I felt confident its reaction would be similar. I dropped my flashlight, reaching for a small can of hairspray and my lighter. I flicked down on the spark wheel and pressed hard on the valve of the can, causing a jet of flame to spray towards the arachnid abomination. As I hoped, it scuttled backwards, stumbling over some old film cans. However, my plan worked too well. The fire ignited the ancient nitrate film reels which were piled on the floor, burning bright and hot. I was nearly blinded as I watched the spider and its children begin to burn, their carapaces blackening in the all-consuming heat. Dropping the hairspray and lighter, I dragged George's body down the stairs, hoping against hope that he was still alive, that he could be saved. I should have realized from how easy it was to carry that drained, eviscerated carcass that there was no chance for him. I sat there, clutching a desiccated corpse on the sidewalk, as I watched the theater go up in flames. When I blubbered what I saw to the firefighters, they assumed I suffered hallucinations due to the burning cellulose nitrate's toxic smoke. I was given a light sentence for the arson. I guess the jury was grateful that I'd killed the ash tree butcher, though the fire burned too hot to recover a body. I served my time and managed to get some support from family after I was released from prison. I guess they felt sorry for me. All things considered, since that night, things have been going okay for me. I have a job. I have an apartment. I have a life. Sure, the nightmares suck, but... At least I'm alive. There is something else. Something that lingers in the back of my mind to this day. While the fire burns the old Fretwell movie theater to the ground, I could have sworn I saw something through the smoke and ash. It was hard to make out, and maybe I was just hallucinating, but I thought I saw some small, rat-sized shapes scurrying off into the darkness their tiny eyes reflecting the lights of the flames.